When Chief Joseph surrendered to the Europeans in the year 1877, he gave a special gift to the general, the general of the Europeans, and the gift turned out to be an ancient Mesopotamian tablet. The chief said that the tablet has been passed down in his family for many generations, and that white men visited his ancestors long time ago. And then this scientific publication assures us that scholars are still scratching their heads while trying to figure out the mystery how could have the chief obtained an original Mesopotamian tablet. I say that those scholars which are scratching themselves can't even figure out how to do that properly as well, because if they were scratching as a normal monkey, they would have already figured out that the Mesopotamian tablet, being one out of the many already found in both Americas, has come to America along with hundreds other artifacts from the Mesopotamians. If we open the school books on the pages about the ancient history of America, we'll read about uh, primitive tribes that were hunting uh, buffaloes, tilling the land again in a primitive way, and all that was going on in complete isolation from the other continents. Furthermore, we were being assured that they were so simple that they didn't even know the wheel. Although artifacts with wheels are exhibited in the museums and nobody doubts their authenticity. This interesting artifact is exhibited in the Museum of La Paz, Bolivia. It has got two types of writing on it. One is either Sumerian or something very close to it, and the other one is yet unknown pictogram writing style. Just to remind you, according to mainstream popular history in this region, there was no writing at all ex except the uh, Kipu writing. This is a uh, kipu, uh, writing with uh, knots and ropes. And then the next nearest writing systems according to mainstream history would be this, the Mayan, Olmec, Aztec and so on. Which is kind of interesting because the artifacts of other types of writing found in America number in uh, hundreds, if not in thousands. This figurine is also part of the La Paz Museum permanent exhibition and it's got some sort of um, signs on the side that also could be interpreted as a form of writing. In the Tayos cave of Ecuador, numerous tablets were found with unknown writing, along with numerous other artifacts showing clear connection between South America and the ancient European and Asian cultures. Various gold tablets were also amongst the artifacts found. These artifacts clearly do not belong to any of the cultures 
that are listed in the school books on America. And the Tayo's cave findings are not isolated case. For example, the priest Father Crespi collected thousands of amazing artifacts from the locals. And as often this type of stories end, there was a mysterious fire and almost everything was destroyed. Basically, he was a very good man and he won the trust of the local people because of uh, doing good things for them and they started uh, gifting him old artifacts. Many of those artifacts showed clear connection with the so-called old world. And that shouldn't be a surprise because uh, the tribes in America are well aware about uh, their brothers on the other side of the ocean. They have uh, recorded an arrival, for example, one of the arrivals is from Aztlan. This Aztlan could very well be Atlantis because um, even the Mayas in Popol Vuh and few other codexes, few other places mention that uh, the people in Aztlan suffered a terrible disaster and flood and uh, fled from their land. And also these people gave them culture and uh, according to Mayas themselves built many wonderful cities. Sylvan Morley has recorded ancient uh, Mayan history where they themselves, the Mayas, tell us that um, some of their white brothers came from Atotlan and that was on the other side of the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean. In Popol Vuh, there are even more detailed descriptions that not only people came from across the ocean, but regular connections were also maintained. The tribes in Guatemala say that even in most adverse conditions, they will never forget their white brothers who came across the ocean from the east and built these wonderful cities here. And these uh, brothers from across the ocean left many artifacts behind themselves. Over time, hundreds of them surfaced in the state of Michigan. Another group of artifacts were found by Russ Burroughs some two decades ago in Illinois. All of them are denied proper scientific study because they do not fit in the history that is being preached in school. A smear campaign was launched, of course, with the help of the mass media, saying that they could be forgery, of course they could be, as every other artifact in every other museum can be questioned without any grounds as well. But especially the legitimacy of the Michigan tablets is uh, very hard to dispute because they were found by completely different groups of people and they documented their findings in uh, the most uh, reliable for that time uh, fashion. Namely, they would take the 10 most respected uh, men of the area or the village where they were building and those men were standing observing that indeed uh, there was an uh, ancient mound being opened and inspected and after that they would sign that uh, yes I was present and I observed that um, this was not some forgery but, but these were real artifacts ex excavated from the earth. By the way, this is the most interesting scene from a Michigan tablet. Here a history lesson is depicted in an ancient classroom. I bet that the kids at that time were much better informed than our kids. Moreover, the Michigan findings were found along with the countless thousands of other artifacts 
connected with the ancient mining again connected uh, with Europe so um, in that case forgery is almost impossible taking into consideration the very number of the artifacts found these precious findings from uh, Michigan were uh, exhibited for some time labeled as a hoax in an official uh, museum that was uh, the way to get them out to the public and I like the label that was placed in that uh, exhibition it said if you know of other findings or other people that are still finding such artifacts in Michigan please do tell us so on one side the organizers of the exhibition say this is a hoax because that's what they are supposed to say in order to organize it and on the other hand they are asking if you know of other findings please tell us and as you can see a lot of the stuff is straightforwardly Egyptian Several hundred antique urns found in the waters of Rio de Janeiro. This is found in West Virginia, same writing as we saw in Ecuador and in Illinois and many other places. So these are definitely not isolated artifacts. This is uh, from El Salvador. And if you feel that you need to see real pyramids to get convinced about the Egyptian presence in uh, America, here they are. And as we covered earlier, the parallels between the building styles of ancient America and Egypt are too many to have evolved without any connection. Even minor details like the inward slanting angle of the walls is the same in both cultures on the both sides of the ocean. What to speak of the polygonal masonry that is extremely complicated style of building that we cannot even replicate now? How come people were using it on both sides of the ocean and the mainstream historians are trying to assure us that they had nothing to do with each other? The Mayan arches uh, bear a remarkable resemblance to those of uh, Ziggurat of Ur in Iraq. Look at the tool marks left on the rock quarries in South America. Well, the Egyptians were using the same tools.
or technique. And yet another artifact with uh, Sumerian like and other writings, Egyptian like writings, this time found in West Virginia in a mound, burial mound. In the collection of artifacts found in Michigan that I mentioned earlier, there was a good number of artifacts with Hebrew writing. And they are not the only ones of this type in America. Here are some from Ohio. And yet another finding from Ohio, this time a Minoan pendant. All the images that I'm showing you in this video are of the actual artifacts found in both Americas. And not like on TV, where allegedly to give you a general idea or to illustrate how things might have been, under such excuses they show artifacts belonging to a completely different places or traditions or cultures or time than the one they're actually talking about or they can even resort to photoshopped images or digital simulations so to say if needed and there is nothing wrong with using all those things to make fantastic professional looking documentaries if they were actually making it clear to the people that all this is fake and highly speculative, which they're not doing instead. They're showing it as real scientific history. Actually, lots of the stuff aired on the History Channel should be aired instead on the Cartoon Network. This is interesting. A uh, Sumerian writing found near a portrait of something that looks like the Lady of Elche. On uh, the right you see the artifact found in Utah, United States. And on the left is the famous Spanish figure. Basically, if one goes to uh, both Americas and visits various official museums, everything will look fine, like here are the artifacts. Uh, they seem to fit the history that is uh, taught in schools. But the reason for that is that they don't let you in the museum vaults. We don't know even what is there. But probably there is quite an interesting stuff, because in the private collections there is no division between stuff that fits the official so-called history and stuff that doesn't. And this is what we find in private collections. Kangaroos in South America. My god, shouldn't be there, no? This poor mammal should have gone extinct some seven to eight million years ago if we believe the mainstream science, right? I mean in South America. So how did the native Indians meet the kangaroos? To avoid such awkward questions, artifacts like this are simply ignored. Nobody disputes the authenticity of uh, such artifacts. In fact, those that are placed next to them on the shelf and are found uh, in the very same burial, belonging, for example, to the Tiwanaku culture, photos of the other comfortable for the modern so-called historical science artifacts, they will be found in scientific publications, even in uh, school textbooks. But as far as the unacceptable for them artifacts, well, they don't exist, simply. A sculpture of a house, again belonging to the Tiwanaku culture. But the houses of this design are not to be found in that area, but they precisely depict the architectural style of uh, the native people of the Pacific Ocean. This uh, peculiar style of roof, for example. Yet another 
group of artifacts again from South America. These houses don't look like the dwellings of the Native Americans. They look maybe European or Asian, but not native. Or at least native in the sense that uh, we are led to believe the natives should have been. Maybe they were not really like this. For example, according to this historic manuscript, details of which you can find in my directory of historic sites, an entire city with European-style writing and um, feel of architecture around was found in Brazil a few centuries ago. So if we are talking of an entire city, these are not a couple of chaps squatting around. These are also native people in a sense because they would have lived there if this manuscript tells the truth. Maybe our entire concept of what native is is wrong. Now this stella may not look um, special at first sight but it was examined by specialists who work with stone and they concluded that this carving could not have been made using another stone or metal tool as well. So the question is how did they carve it? I mean a simple metal tool. This is an artifact found in Patagonia and yet some of the signs are actually letters from the Semitic alphabet. Is this my great great grandfather? Looks like him. So here not only we have a swastika but also we have a person uh, who sits like kind of Buddha or maybe some sort of yoga position. This is a very interesting parallel between the writing system of the Indus Valley of India and Pakistan and that of Easter Islands of Chile. In the background is the Easter uh, Island writing and on the front is the Indus Valley writing. Now you remember the interesting Michigan artifacts. They were centered around the mining society. Copper was mined there. Big natural chunks of copper uh, are found over there. This is an example of a big one weighing 3 tons. So many artifacts were found that even they had to build a small local museum, many archaeologists were involved, it was uh, difficult to cover up the full thing, so they had to come up with some sort of explanation, what is this all about? So the explanation they fabricated is like this, all this was done by some ancient tribe of hunter-gatherers, people who didn't even have homes, they were not yet um, advanced enough to have a settled life. 
or any agriculture or any culture as such. And yet, these people who didn't even have ceramics, they were supposedly manufacturing in industrial quantities these advanced tools, moreover in European style. This uh, wild people didn't have any forks or plates or anything and yet they were uh, melting and pouring metal and shaping it in sophisticated tools. I mean, in what would you even pour the molten liquid metal if you don't know what a bowl is? Did they pour it in banana leaves or coconut uh, shells? Even many mainstream historians frankly and openly admit that all these stories and uh, putting all these items in such faraway time, giving them such a period of dating is uh, straightforwardly ridiculous, but still this remains the official version of history, although it is not supported even by the official historians as such. In the description of the video you can find the link with a lecture with more details about uh, Poverty Point, that's the name of the location in Michigan where the mining was taking place. So Jay Weckerfeld tells us more about the Europeans who actually came over there to mine copper. Something else very interesting to watch is the work of uh, Jim Vieira and um, Fritz Zimmermann about the enormous um, megalithic mounds found in rather large numbers all over America. The culture that was building those is also absolutely ignored and excluded from the school books of America. The link is also found in the description below. The reason for ignoring full cultures, even when there are plenty of artifacts left from them, is that these cultures belonged to the people that survived from the old advanced civilizations. These people still had the technology to freely travel between continents. But the modern parasitic paradigm is trying to trick the people into thinking that the only way to have advanced technology and civilizations is to comply with their ideas and their parasitic way of life of pollution, war, lies and violence. And all traces of advanced civilizations that could travel between continents and build amazing megaliths are simply ignored as much as possible. Here we see a blonde boy amongst the Maori people. This is an old photo. This doesn't naturally occur in their race. But maybe he was born blonde because the old genes of people that were coming from Atlantis or, or from Europe got manifested in him. There was a tribe in Dakota called Mandan Indians. They are now wiped out. But travelers who were in America a few centuries ago described some of the members of this tribe as light-haired and blue-eyed people. So apparently there were tribes of all races. Now, this uh, multi-racial tribe situation doesn't at all suit the fabricated history that is being preached in schools and that's why all kind of uh, clever methods are devised to distract uh, the attention of the general public from the actual truth. And if one starts uh, talking about uh, Caucasian people in ancient America, that is immediately followed by loud screams that uh, are supposed to make the Caucasian people feel guilty and feel that they are robbing the natives out of their glorious history. In reality, it is the history fabricators who are disrespecting the history that the native people are keeping about their white brothers. 
the history fabricators are working hard to erase the memory of everybody of the times when the native and Caucasians were friends. The parasites have driven the Native Americans in reservations and have simply stolen their land. On the other side, they are actively trying to convert all Caucasian people into their parasitic paradigm and scam them into believing that the only path towards progress is plundering most shamelessly the riches of other races and then bombing their countries to death and destruction and while all that is going on we are cutting everybody together led by the parasites cutting the very branch that we stand on by poisoning the very planet we live on the only way to put an end to this suicidal path of ours is to get back to the old ways the ways that were shown to us by the survivors of Atlantis and Hyperborea. When those survivors arrived in America, they taught their knowledge of amazing megalith building and many other things to the locals. They did not kill or plunder the locals. And the genes of uh, Viracocha, his descendants, can still be found amongst the nowadays Peruvians. You see the girl with the blonde hair? Some more blue-eyed Peruvian gods. Again, the color of the hair of the mist fully corresponds to the statuettes found in this culture. Do you notice uh, the blonde uh, beards of the men? And as usual, Atlantis slash Hyperborea fashion band on their forehead. Well, the last few photographs were Caucasian mummies from Peru, but uh, it's not different in uh, North America. Pizarro wrote about his experiences with the Incas in Peru and apparently he met the uh, white people ruling over there. Unfortunately, as usual, the original of his writings is not available, it has disappeared, only copies are available. But even after undergoing parasitic edition, here and there some useful information does transpire in his writings. He also mentions that uh, there were many fine hotels, for example. Question arises who could have uh, built the uh, hotels that would appear to be very fine according to the taste of a refined uh, Spanish gentleman of that time. Some other sources uh, quote him telling that he found some 500 of the Caucasian Inca gods still well and uh, living amongst them. 
as we will see later on all of the books uh, at the time written at the time when supposedly America was discovered for the first time were not to the taste of the history fabricators and that's why they were all quarantined and uh, later on their originals uh, all disappeared and only edited copies are available nowadays this is an old painting of uh, fair skin skinned Inca rulers, Inca kings. So everybody and everything was there in America. Giants, dwarfs, also alien species, brand foresters, publishing excellent research on this topic. You can see it on his YouTube channel. Is this man putting an injection on the poor giant? Okay, that means that giants are no more. And in terms of dwarves, it's not only mummies and uh, legends. Actually, in one of the interviews that somebody was taking from me, he was telling his own experience when he was uh, visiting a tribe of uh, dwarves. I don't know if they still live. Maybe, maybe not. Or maybe they were visited by a group of soldiers funded by taxpayers money officially going towards the spread of democracy that's how they call it yes such uh, groups of murderers i are paid by nato or the european union lately they are also putting aside was it i don't know millions or billions for having their own military power these are the types of tasks they carry out of this money and also they are in a close cooperation. When I was in Peru, I spoke uh, with a man who was in the army, as uh, many other men, and he was telling me how when they receive an order, they are just uh, sent to the jungle to clear up a certain tribe. It means just murder them all on the spot. That, that's what they do. It seems that they cleared in America already almost everything that they needed to clear and such operations are mostly done in Africa now. But the information is so scarce that uh, we don't even know to what extent is it done and how is it going on exactly because um, our attention is uh, distracted with uh, the Middle East where also horrible things happen for sure to the peaceful civilians of course only probably um, but uh, it seems that the people that are actually being killed at the moment are much more in africa but anyhow we are on the subject of the americas now this is a newborn baby and already with elongated skull so it is not as they are telling us that the mothers are, were putting painful bandages on their poor kids to make them look weird. Apparently people were born that way. At least in certain cases, for sure. Here in this video there are more additional resources on the topic. Now these are very old photos of uh, Native Americans. Some of these people clearly don't have the characteristics of the red Native American race. And I think that's absolutely normal because we saw so many artifacts of uh, cultures from all over the world and uh, mummies from people from all over the world. We'll see also uh, African in a while. So. All these uh, races, they came with their artifacts, they mixed with the local people. It was really, uh, as every other continent, pretty much international place. Some Seminole Indians in uh, their traditional outfits, they look as if they have come straight from Europe. The double-headed eagle, that is uh, one of the main state uh, symbols, the emblem of the Empire of the Survivors, that we'll review in the next few episodes. 
Now, this is a very, very interesting archaeological site in Brazil. The stones of which this wall is made are some 30 by 40 meters. Some of them are 40 meters long. I don't even know, is this uh, from the earlier waves of the survivors or is it something even uh, pre-survivor time? For example, this inscription is found in that region of Brazil, but the Brazil regions are rather large, so it doesn't necessarily mean they are connected. I find this uh, wall in Pariba very, very interesting, and it seems it is a part of a touristy area where tourists are taken on a regular basis. But as far as I understand, they bring them in the areas in the vicinity, but not to the wall itself. The area around this huge wall in Pariba looks very similar to the area around the mysterious Inga stone. Now, uh, the Inga stone is officially declared a total mystery, because they can't find the culture to blame it on in their fairy tale lists of approved cultures and also because uh, it's not clear what kind of language or science are these nobody's got a clue on and most importantly again the method of application seems to be unknown to us they don't seem the marks, the signs, don't seem to be chiseled out. It seems as if somebody was melting the rock and then just pressing them in. But the most suspicious thing about the Inga area, and it's the absolutely same situation around the Great Wall of Pariba, are these very regular round marks. I mean, just look at the edges of the big one on this photograph. It really looks like the stone has splashed around on the right side. Was something hitting and melting the stone? Well, it doesn't end here. I think these types of damages on the stone can reveal really, really a lot about our lot lost history because they are found on other places on earth and always 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 on sites that don't fit the official narration of fairy tales that we are told is our history it's in africa it's in bulgaria on on the elf castles those particular marks were examined by a geologist and he doesn't think that uh, they could have had a natural origin. So, in various previous videos, I showed exactly such round marks on various sites. I believe the last case was in the Middle East. And again, only on the historic site itself, not in the forest around. Why not in the forest round? The same rocks are there just a couple of meters away. Why no home holes over there? The most likely explanation so far, at least for me, is that uh, some sort of uh, Sodom and Gomorrah style weapon has been applied to destroy the remains of the old advanced civilization. Civilizations, to be more precise. gentleman called William Niven discovered an entirely new culture in Central America and not somewhere in the inaccessible dense jungles where it is hard to study, but just outside of Mexico City. It had its own pictographic writing as well. And as you can see, the walls of their buildings were quite impressive, yeah, compared to the man standing on the left. So it was a relatively advanced culture. And uh, Niven managed to collect some 40,000 artifacts from the site 
which by itself is enough to make a museum. So what happened after that? The full thing got closed down and the artifacts are nowhere to be found anymore. Why? Because the culture wasn't primitive enough. It didn't comply with the fairy tales about the ancient history of America. So all we have is a photograph of some, let's say, 10 items out of the thousands. So we see here simple stone beads and things like this. They don't contradict the official historic fairy tales. But if all the other artifacts didn't contradict as well, then why did they hide them from us? Now the topic of uh, depictions of elephants in uh, the pre-Columbian era is very uncomfortable for mainstream so-called historians because uh, elephants in America, okay, they say they should have been there, but that is like some 10 to 12,000 years ago. Actually, the elephant depictions and statues and murals and everything, they are so numerous that they can't do the usual procedure as uh, they have for uncomfortable artifacts, hide them, destroy them, declare them forgeries. They can't because um, the carvings are there on the walls of so many pre Columbian cities, for example. So what they do is they pretend that they don't know about them or when it's obvious it is declared a mystery. Yeah, very convenient and apparently people buy it. This one, for example, belongs to the Tiwanaku culture. This is from uh, the Michigan Illinois collections. This one again, uh, South America, Peru, I believe. The Mayas even used uh, the elephants in uh, their writing. And it's not just the elephants. The story with the bananas is the same. And the proof about the pre-Columbian bananas comes not only from excavations, but also from li linguistic studies. And many other things. Here we see Polynesian chickens. When? If they had uh, models, statues of their houses, then no surprise that they had some of their chicken as well. Now, this is a very interesting group of artifacts from Mexico. Allegedly, they are ancient Mayan. Some people have a little bit of a difficulty accepting them as uh, historic artifacts just because the style of depiction, for example, the rockets are drawn in such a way as if they are meant specifically to cater to the general imagination that people exactly nowadays have about aliens. But this doesn't mean that the artifacts are not genuine. Klaus Donna, an Austrian researcher, claims to have done tests on them, so they could be genuine as well. Now, this is a relative of the elephants, but not exactly the elephant that we know nowadays. This is a prehistoric animal, the remains of which have been excavated in other parts of the world. 
And by the way, those animals, according to mainstream sources, got extinct some 20 million years ago. Wow, doesn't it sound impressive? They knew what was going on even 20 million years ago, don't they? So how did the simple-minded, supposedly, Native Americans know about these animals? I think it was those savages uh, who were mining the copper, you remember? And they were forging sophisticated items, even though they didn't have a home or even a bowl to eat from. Maybe it was them who put together a time machine and went back in time to visit these animals and make a statue with them. I mean, tell the Tiwanaku people how they looked like. Or, or maybe the time has come for us to stop believing these stupid lies that we call history. The famous Olmec heads. Obviously, they depict people of African looks. They are also seen depicted on the murals of those faraway times. They didn't put black color on their skin just because the Native Americans are also of dark complexion. As you can see here, the what we call now Native Americans are depicted with their proper color and the African people are also depicted with their proper color. Aztecs are now completely or almost completely wiped out, but this is how some of them used to look like. And not only Africans, races from all over the world were coming and going in America all the time. These are Chinese Olmecs. And uh, this is a girl that, uh, one of the many uh, Asian looking girls that I met in the Amazon forest. The Shipibo tribe, amongst which I spent a an year and a half or more, they looked completely Asian. This is a Shipibo girl. So, recently, a new ancient city was discovered in the dense jungle of Honduras. It's called Copan. Interestingly enough, here we see a monkey deity. Surprisingly, I say, because in India they also have Hanuman. And interestingly enough, the Hanuman of Honduras also holds a club maybe in his hand which is also the typical way he is depicted in India. And it's not just the uh, artifacts proving that the Americas were well connected with the other continents in pre-Columbian time I mean of it's also their written and uh, verbally transmitted history. Popol Vuh, the historic book of the Maya Kiche people from Guatemala, describes in this manner the visitors from across the Atlantic Ocean who used to be in touch with the Native Americans in pre-Columbian times. They lived together. They came in great numbers. Some of them were white, others were black people. They had many different classes and various languages. It was amazing to just listen to them. But their speech was the same. 
So on one side, Popol Vuh says they had many languages, and on the other side, uh, it, it says that uh, their speech was same. So obviously they had some uh, common language that all of them knew, or maybe they meant that their writing was uh, the same, something like that. The traveler James Churchworth observed that um, some Japanese and certain American tribes can understand each other without translators. The anthropologist Carlos Villanueva noticed something very, very interesting. A tribe from India called Nagas that lives in India in Asia has a language that is very similar to the language of the Yucatan native Maya Indians. Similar, okay, but all languages are similar more or less. How similar are these two? How similar? Well, 90% identical with each other. 90%? That is serious. Even my tomcat thinks this is outrageous. Well, maybe the people as well should start realizing that the so-called history taught in school is an utter nonsense. Further examples along these lines can be found in this book as well. Brighton Beach, New York. The beach is fortified with large stones against the waves coming from the ocean. But the stones appear to be parts of some sort of a ruins. For example, here a fluted column. Are these stones the ruins of a historic site that we are not supposed to hear about? So hopefully by now you already wonder how on earth did this history, so-called history of the Americas, the official one, come to be anyway? I mean, it is not based on the idea that the native people themselves had about their own history, nor it is based on study of actual historic sites and artifacts, obviously, because it doesn't match thousands of them. Actually, the official history of the Americas was just composed. It's, a, it's just a literature. Somebody decided to write down a story. And who did that? Characters like this one composed the history of the Americas. Diego de Landa, merciless murderer, who destroyed countless precious artifacts of the culture and history of the native people, throwing them in the fire together with the people. And after destroying all that he could uh, get his, his hands on, he sat and started writing the history of America. And of course, all his writings are now taken as pure and indisputable truth and are very often quoted as unauthentic sources of American history. It is his books exactly that are the main cornerstone of the mainstream current history of America. In the 17th century, the military forces of the Reformation reached America. The European Reformation was most cruel war. It was a pure military action against the real history and the old paradigm of peaceful existence of the people. It is very mistakenly represented nowadays as uh, some sort of a movement not to have church bells and organ music and to have the Bible translated into uh, modern German. And because of all these intellectual ideas, the population of Europe was largely wiped out, means cruelly killed. And those same military forces arrived in America with the same intention to destroy all old, old books, old knowledge and old artifacts and to introduce with force their new parasitic paradigm. No wonder that their prime target were the old books and the old artifacts. Their job was much easier in America. They managed to kill large amount of people, especially the keepers of the truth, so 
there was uh, nobody to speak anymore. The fabrication of the history was just in the hands of few chosen people and that was very easy to manage. They were explained, they were told what are they supposed to write and what they should not write and that's how it was done. There were Caucasian people, Christians, living in America long before the arrival of Columbus. So it is not that the European people as such caused out all this, it was the reformation process. Now look at this example. This is how the reformation history fabricators describe their fellow men, namely the gangs of hired murderers who were sent out to clean up America. The men who arrived were very peaceful, God-fearing and compassionate fellows, but all the problems occurred because of those strange Native Americans, who for some unknown reason were trying to fight them. Strange! Invaders are coming, stealing their land, killing them, uh, burning their artifacts and all that, and isn't it strange that the Indians were uh, fighting back? Well, that's how it was presented in the earlier writings of the so-called historians. And well, the patience of the good uh, reformators, that's how they present the things, when uh, they run out of patience, they started, uh, well, killing the Indians. How sad! Well, not all native Indians were killed. Some of them survived. And the compassionate reformators took such a great care of these people. They gave them blankets to get covered in the cold. And how! What a bad luck! And again, so strange, the native Indians started dying after using those blankets. Well, they were infected with disease. U.S. was formed in here. 1776 and that is right after the last pieces of the empire of the survivors were swallowed by the newly formed country at that time called Russia in Europe. This will be covered in detail in the future episodes. Before that uh, all both the American continents were officially territory of this empire. After a few decades, the people who were living witnesses of all this died and the history was twisted. And they wrote the stories about U.S. getting its independence from England. No, it didn't. But exactly the opposite is true. It's at this moment of history when England finally could start influencing the Americas and that is the case till now because uh, the governments of uh, US and England are till date completely bought and sold by the same rich uh, clans or, or families who practically pull behind the scenes the string of all major political events now on earth. And they managed to rule the earth mainly through the proxies of the governments of USA and England, which has now turned into the European Union. In the future episodes I will be showing you evidence, proof about this empire of the survivors, Tartaria, how it existed and then how was it defeated. And then all this will make much more sense. And as far as the newly formed America, initially it was inhabited by people who more or less were still living in this paradigm of righteous, uh, respectable life of honesty and nobility. Okay, they were defeated, but this, uh, this, this didn't erase their morals straight away. And that is why initially the Constitution of the United States was very well formulated and human rights were really respected. 
and later on the parasitic forces who were actually those who hired the uh, reformation murderers gradually over the centuries they managed to poison the minds of the people through mass media very very gradually and subtly and um, also poison their bodies with alcohol and as people were getting gradually disconnected from their higher selves they could swallow up more and more insane governmental rules and regulations which actually took away their basic human rights the modern fabricated history that we are taught in school is also called Scaligarian because its backbone was uh, written down by a chap called Scaliger during the Reformation period. So to make it look like something real, often the modern scholars add also quotes from Popol Vuh because this is a traditional, original Mayan book. And those quotes, they are simply taken out of context. We are not told the full story, only the parts that would match the fantasy history, only they will be quoted. Actually, the book itself contains numerous references with uh, connection of... Uh, people on, from the other side of the ocean and even regular connections with the Christian church in Europe that far. They go in giving details about these transatlantic connections. So how can they get away with uh, ignoring such things? Well, first of all, they don't even tell the ordinary people these things. And second of all, if some specialists happen to find references to such things, they immediately provide with the excuse of, you know what, this must have been added later to Popol Vuh. It, it cannot be added earlier, right? Because then it won't fit our fantasies. And yeah, so let's compare with the original, right? Oh, that's conveniently missing as well. So that's how this Caligarian history is imposed upon us with deceit, with cheap tricks. Another frequently quoted source by those who are trying to impose this Caligar history in America is the work called Historia Verdadera de la Conquesta de la Nueva España, written by a member of uh, the crew of Cortes, Bernal Diaz. The first-hand uh, witness accounts of this crew member are often quoted as a proof of the validity of the fabricated Scaliger history of America. Let's see what is the real situation. First of all, although full Europe was uh, supposedly brewing with excitement for the supposed discovery of um, America, it took them hundred years, according to the Scaliger um, timeline anyway, it took them hundred years to finally print out the book. Very strange, why did they keep it locked up for such a long time? Maybe because it didn't suit the stories that they're selling to the people. Another question that arises is where is the actual original? Because what was printed out was uh, honestly mentioned to be, uh, well, uh, with corrections. A few things were incorrect, so they were corrected before the book was printed out. <laughs> what does this mean? And most importantly, where is the actual original? The book that was printed out appears to be written by a professional writer, person with uh, lots of experience in writing books. It certainly doesn't use the vocabulary and style of a ship crew member. Most likely, the changes that they themselves admit making to the book must have been rather major ones, and that's why they're hiding the original till date. Las Casa was another Spanish priest who wrote his uh, observations during the time of Cortes, 
and is often quoted by the Scaliger supporters as uh, again a genuine first-hand witness so what about the original again his work was published 400 years after it was written although the society at that time in Europe was jumping with excitement to find out what was going on the main body of his work was so to say quarantined in Spanish archives without any access and was denied any study for all these 400 years, while other works of his, minor works that did not contradict this Caligir version, were printed much earlier. And again, the originals, as usual, remain hidden, locked up or destroyed, even maybe, till date. Numerous other historic authors are also often quoted, quoted as uh, reliable sources because they were uh, first-hand witnesses again to the events. But um, they don't mention the small detail that these people were born, let's say, 100 or more years after the Reformation conquest of America. And um, they're called witnesses, but they didn't really see the things with their own eyes. They on only heard about the events. And they might have been, uh, even if their works were not edited, they might have been themselves brainwashed and lied to about what happened, let's say, 100 years ago. This is absolutely possible. I mean, uh, like nowadays we also have wars, for example, in the Middle East. And even though the events are going on right now and um, exchange of information is uh, so much easier and more efficient nowadays with the help of various technical gadgets and yet people in different countries, in different parts of the world, get a radically different information about who are the parties involved in these wars in the Middle East. Who is fighting who? I'm not talking about details of the military actions taking place. I'm talking about who are the parties involved. So, regardless of who exactly is getting the right information and who is getting the wrong, in any case, there will be a group of people who are getting a completely irrelevant information as of what kind of war is going on right now. So, if it is possible to fool people about events which are happening in front of their eyes, how much easier would it be to fool them about things which happened hundreds or thousands of years ago? After the short break, let's get back to the artifacts. This is the Chaco culture on the territory of uh, current New Mexico. The architectural style is strongly reminiscent to that of the old world. And so are the dwellings of the Anasazi Indian tribe found in the state of Utah and also the Chachapoya ruins. The red-haired mummies, some of them that we saw earlier, came from this tribe. Teotihuacan is a very famous tourist uh, attraction, but 99% of what the visitors see is uh, the fantasy of the restoration teams who thought that it must uh, look like that and so they rebuilt it in this fashion. Yes, there are parts of the complex that uh, are intact, that are still in their original condition. Those are mainly the underground tunnels. Tunnels, it's a large network of them, but of course they're locked and nobody has the right to study them. 
The attention of the visitors is distracted with uh, highly speculative ideas about different platforms being connected to various stars. Yes, certainly, and that is a very clever way to distract people's attention because there are countless platforms and countless stars. One may draw lines between them one's entire life and still there will be many possibilities left. But what I would like to show you are a few images from the back side, so to say, of the historic site, where few of the original blocks have been forgotten. They forgot to hide them from the tourists. Or, alternatively, somebody crossed in the forbidden area to take the photographs. But what we see are very regularly cut stones, they leave the impression that some sort of high-tech tools have been used or they have been cast out of geopolymer. And in addition, we are being assured that the builders lived in this type of housing. Then how come in the preserved parts of the old historic Kiwatiwakan, we see a radically different picture. We find large platforms, entire squares, covered with thick layer of cement. Even the walls and uh, the floors of all houses are covered with thick layer of cement. In the original writings of those who excavated the city for the first time, we read that even the roofs above the wooden beams, they would have a thick layer of cement as well. So why, according to the official history, some hut dwellers built Tiwatiwakan? Is there some sort of evidence for it? It turns out exactly the opposite is the case. Well, those who have done actual on-field research are uh, telling completely different things. Miguel Cova Rubias says that mysterious foreign elite whose motherland was situated somewhere else in the East stood at the top of the new civilized society formed on the basis of the cultural fusion of the two cultural streams, local and foreign. Now, that makes sense. The rough primitive work, that is typically local style, and the perfectly shaped blocks, yes, that is foreign influence. So, actually, many historians are doing their work. It is simply not included in the proper history of the school books. That's all. Uh, next, the Swiss explorer Sigvald Lini, who many years conducted excavation on the territory of the city, says the local population was altogether driven out from the valley by some unknown alien people, who over time created a brilliant civilization of the classic era. So this one he doesn't even talk about fusion. He thinks that the locals were completely driven away. Many, many anthropologists are also noticing the obvious parallel between the Asian and the American uh, arts. They could not have developed independent, independently, they were intertwined. If you wish to explore their research in depth, here are some of the names. Paul River, Jose Imbilioni, Carl Genze, Leonard Adam, many of them. An interesting Mayan archaeological site in Mexico is Palenque. In the famous um, temple of inscriptions, a couple of images are found where it seems that the people wearing spacesuits and using sophisticated technical equipment could be depicted. Or at least many people choose to interpret it in that way. But what about the actual burial on the top of uh, which uh, the famous uh, carving has been found? We are being told that a Mayan noble person is buried there. But uh, why? On the basis of what? When the research of the skeleton was first conducted, uh, the person who did it uh, 
said that uh, the remains are distinctly different from those of a Maya noble and the teeth did not have any of the semi-precious stone inlaids that all Maya nobles had. Today the researchers of course have no access to this uh, skeleton and as a matter of fact to the full uh, temple of inscriptions. Those who dare this to suggest that the actual burial was of a person belonging to this race of gods, this advanced technical civilization that uh, came to give knowledge to the local tribes, such people are categorized as conspirators, while the actual artifacts are locked up. I would like to know on the basis of what the people who want to know the truth are labeled as conspirators and those who actually hide the artifacts are labeled as scientists. It seems quite the opposite to me because uh, people who hide things, those are the conspirators. I call survivors the people who came and uh, educated, fused with local tribes, local cultures for good. Actually, you have heard already many times about these survivors, but they were always called with different names. Just in this very episode, when I was reading various quotes, they were called uh, aliens, newcomers, visitors, gods, etc. But there is no doubt that these are the very same people and that is why, for example, we see similarities in the building techniques and materials across oceans. The cement at Tiwatiwakan, we see the same cement, for example, of course in Europe, but also in Asia. For example, in Myanmar, in Cambodia, and in many countries in Southeast Asia, the mainstream so-called scholars don't talk very much about the origins of this cement because they will sound a bit stupid, telling us that, uh, well, people must have come up with it and invented it at various spots and continents independently of each other, just like that. There is an absolutely massive pyramid in the Mexican city of Cholula. It's covered with clay, whole lots of clay, many meters stack on each other. According to mainstream history, this pyramid was first discovered in year 1910. But how is that possible if a uh, hundred years before that the famous German explorer Alexander Humboldt described it clearly as a pyramid? He also described it as having four platforms. That means that it is entirely possible that this uh, very thick layer of uh, clay somehow magically landed over there within this span of 100 years prior to the so-called discovery of the pyramid in 1910. In old manuscripts kept in the Vatican, this uh, Chula pyramid is also clearly described and it is described as a pyramid. However, this information is absolutely absent from the so-called history that is presented to us by the mainstream so-called science. So the modern mainstream sources on Cholula, instead of telling us uh, the little that we can find about it in the old sources, they are telling us versions, stories, which are supported by absolutely nothing, like zero evidence. And the version is that the Spanish organized this cover with the clay upon their arrival. 
Well, not only there is no evidence about it, but uh, this version contradicts whatever little evidence we have. Or alternatively, another fairy tale is offered that uh, the native Indians, when, when they heard that the Spanish are arriving, uh, they covered it with uh, clay themselves which is also not supported by any uh, historic documents and as well is impossible to complete in short terms due to the large amount of clay that is uh, piled up on the top of the pyramid. This uh, pyramid is actually the biggest pyramidal structure in the world. Moreover, the thickness of the clay layer is uh, many meters in height. The question arises, was the pyramid covered with clay in very recent times from above? And if so, what kind of technology did they use for it? Extensive and complex network of tunnels with a total length of some uh, at least 8 kilometers is found under the pyramid of Cholula. Both mainstream historians and the local guides who have heard it from them are trying to assure everybody that this uh, network of uh, channels was dug out by the archaeologists in the course of their uh, excavations on the site. Again, absolutely no mention that the 16th century historian was already describing them. The very well-respected Alexander Humboldt also mentions them some 100-200 years before they were supposedly dug out. At the time when the tunnels were being allegedly dug out, a Russian researcher of that time writes down that they are actually cleaning them. Many of tunnels are locked, by the way, and most importantly, they don't look like they have been uh, dug out uh, by archaeologists hastily. They have uh, smooth walls, they, they look as if they have been built, actually, when the pyramid was built. As a contrast, a uh, few small portions of uh, tunnels were indeed made in modern times to make the passage of tourists easier and those have uh, very rough sides. They are visibly different from the old tunnels which also have peculiar ceilings. And in addition to everything said so far, some of the entries to the tunnels are partially blocked or buried by historic layers. Yet another proof that these are not modern tunnels we are being lied to. But most importantly, research was done inside the system of tunnels, testing their acoustic properties. Why would they test such a thing if these were modern tunnels? The mainstream establishment is not only well aware that these are ancient um, tunnels, but also they know very well what kind of technology the survivors were using. And that is why they tested if uh, the tunnels are still functioning and what are they doing exactly. And of course, needless to say, as usual, the results of the acoustic tests are nowhere to be found. And they are not even mentioned in the popular official history of the pyramid. Instead, they are giving us these speculations which are based on nothing. The local people in Cholula still remember from their forefathers the real history of the pyramid. It was built by very tall people, seven of them foreigners, who arrived in their land because they had to flee from their homes due to a terrible flood and disaster that has taken place over there. These are the people whom I call the survivors. And since the inhabitants of uh, pre-Columbian 
America who were well connected with the other continents already. That's why we find artifacts in those pre-Columbian historic layers and cultures which are connected to the world religions. These are examples from the Tiwanaku culture. This is a most excellent example from Patagonia. It's probably from the time when Christianity and Islam were still one single religion. And that's why their symbols are um, depicted together. And the Christian cross is uh, found on the pre-Columbian artifacts and depictions. But uh, it seems it's not just uh, like an information about a religion that exists somewhere else. It is also uh, probably the main symbol or one of the main symbols uh, on the outfits and paraphernalia of the ancient uh, warriors. Of course, somebody may object, you know, the cross as such is uh, such a simple design, basically two lines crossing each other. Maybe they came up with the symbol independently from Europe. Yeah, this statement taken out of context does make sense. But when we see along with it, always the crescent symbol, and here we see even uh, something that looks like a crucifixion scene, again with Christian cross hanging at the bottom of the depiction. There are too many similarities, and it's not just a coincidence. Again, Mayan depiction with the crescent symbol. It's a very interesting uh, book that tells us about uh, the Christianity on the American uh, continent before the arrival of uh, Columbus. It is called the Book of Mormon. But uh, because this uh, book does not agree at all with the Scaliger version of history that is being preached in the schools, that's why it is declared by the modern so-called historians as having no historic value at all. To declare that a given old book has no historic value, even though it is supported by numerous artifacts and historic sites and facts. In the Mormon tradition, they also have their researchers and theosophical scholars. They have found numerous confirmations about um, certain historic claims in their book. But to just say that this book has no historic value at all is a cheap trick, a smear campaign meant to erase the last traces of our true history in order to replace it with a new fraudulent one. Why? Because the concept that we have about our own origin influences greatly the way we choose to live our lives in the current moment. This is a Michigan pre-Columbian artifact. No wonder that the uh, early Christian missionaries exactly in the Michigan area repeatedly report that uh, they found already the locals writing full passages from the Bible in some sort of uh, language that was uh, very some sort of writing that was very similar to Middle East. Eastern alphabets. And as you saw, plenty of tablets were excavated from the very same area with uh, exactly that type of writing. Another pre-Columbian 
Native American artifact. Garcilaso de la Vega was the son of a Spanish conquistador and an Incan noble lady born in the early years of the conquest. He tells us about a very precious and special artifact that the Incas were keeping with great reverence. It was a white marble Christian cross. After they were defeated by the conquistadors, that cross was taken away from them, but even the Spanish respected it greatly without having any doubt at all that it is a Christian cross. And one of the main cathedrals that they built was meant to specifically house this cross. So obviously the Incas were very well aware about the Christianity even before the um, Spanish conquest. Peter Martyr Dangere is one of the many who confirms that uh, the native Indians knew very well about Christ when the missionaries arrived. He gives uh, as an example the Cosumelia Islands in the Yucatan Peninsula. He says, they had an image of Jesus Christ and were bowing down in front of him. They knew very well about the Holy Trinity as well. They also knew how God manifested in flesh in the form of his Son. It is not by chance that extremely interesting historic sites are left unattended in the jungles or in the deserts of America to get overgrown or destroyed by erosion gradually, like these pyramids in Paratuari. Not only they have clearly pyramidal shape, but also they are neatly ordered, yeah, one next to the other, in a line, in two lines. So it says here in this brief report, excursions to the region found plenty of evidence of Inca inhabitants in the area, such as petroglyphs, paved roads and platforms. This really made me think Look how densely overgrown is this entire area. If people who just go out there on an excursion means non-professionals visiting for a very short time, if they can find easily in this deep jungle platforms, roads, etc., then what are we going to find if we make a serious cleanup and excavation of the area. And the same applies to this, as far as I understand, several quite large pyramidal structures in Ecuador. They are hard to access. It's many hours of very difficult walk in a treacherous jungle terrain. If the so-called historians, or to be more precise, those who remotely control the international community of historians and all scientists, without any exceptions, if they were really interested in finding out the true history of humanity, they wouldn't be ignoring and in many cases actively destroying this type of historic sites. Wow. So the benevolent spirits and angels, the well-wishers and the guardians of our forefathers, well, we severed our connection with them, but they did not forget us. And actually, I could present this collection of artifacts and information to you only by the mercy of the great spirit of the Amazon, the great teacher spirit of the Amazon, Ayahuasca.